and welcome to the Wormhole Podcast, episode 79, bringing on an author and talking with them in detail about one, occasionally more, of their books. I'm Charlie Place, and today I am joined by Lisa C., the best-selling author of books including Snowflower and the Secret Fan, On Gold Mountain, Shanghai Girls, and The Island of Sea Women. We'll be talking about her latest book today, Lady Tan's Circle of Women, which is about the life of Tan Yunxian, a woman doctor in 1400s China. So without further ado, hello, Lisa. Hello, thank you for having me. It's lovely to have you on. This is a real pleasure. We will get right into it. So I've said to you before we press record, I'm probably going to pronounce the name wrong, but I'm going to do my best. Tan Yunxian was a real person, and we know about her due to the book of medical cases that she published. Could you tell us all about her life and about her book? Yeah, we'll go from there. So Tan Yunxian was born into a very elite family. Her father was an imperial scholar, her grandfather, her uncles, generations of imperial scholars. So she was quite privileged, also educated. And she was actually trained by her grandparents, particularly her grandmother, to treat people, to become a doctor. And this started when she was a little girl. Her grandfather actually thought she was so clever and so smart and had said, you know, instead of reciting, learning to recite poetry, she should learn my medicine. And then the grandmother was like, well, yeah, that's nice, but she should really learn my medicine. <laughs> and obviously the grandmother had, you know, more female patients and the grandfather would have had male patients as well as female patients. In those days in Chinese medicine, a male doctor couldn't see a woman patient. He couldn't touch her. So he would sit behind a screen or sometimes all the way outside of the room and would use that woman's husband or father to relay his questions. He would say to the man, like, what ails you? And then the man would go in and ask his wife, what ails you? And she would have to give these details back. You can imagine for certain things like a sore throat, not a big deal, but things that have to do more with female reproduction would be perhaps more embarrassing, especially back then. But as a woman doctor, Tan Yanshan and her grandmother could be in the room with women and girls. They could see what their complexion looked like. They could actually take a woman's pulse by actually touching her. In Chinese medicine, there are 26 different pulses that you can feel in the wrists. So this was a very refined art, but a male doctor typically would not be able to do that. And if a woman was so sick that she required the doctor to actually be in the room and for him to take her pulse, they'd wrap cloth around her wrist. So she wasn't really getting the full thing. And then the most important part for Tan Yanshan is that she could ask these very embarrassing, very intimate questions, woman to woman. And as a result, her patients were much more open with her. And there was this philosophy in Chinese medicine that a woman was 10 times more difficult to treat than a man. That was an actual saying and an actual belief. But again, part of it was a male doctor couldn't be in the room with her. He couldn't actually treat her. Plus the fact that, again, all of those sort of issues related to female reproduction were embarrassing and awkward and difficult for male doctors to get any sense of truth. So you had asked about her book. So when Tan Yanshan turned 50, she published a book of her cases. It's called Miscellaneous Records of a Female Doctor. And in it, she records very specific cases of women and girls, what the situation was that brought these women to her, what their ailments were, what their symptoms were, and then how she then treated that patient. And so it also has the recipes for different herbal treatments, 
whether it's a tea or a poultice or different kinds of ways that they would treat through herbal medicine, and then what the results were. So this book, although it was published back in 1511, is available not just in Chinese today, but also in English and in many other languages around the world because so many of her treatments are still used today. And the book itself is used in many traditional Chinese medicine colleges. Well, that's something that I was wondering as you were saying that, you know, are her recipes still used and things like that? So, I mean, yeah, that that's quite amazing, really, that all this time later, her knowledge is still being used. Something that I wasn't completely sure if I had right or not, and I think it's, it's worth asking and, and getting the knowledge from you, is there didn't seem to be that I could find all that much that we knew about her life in general. And I was wondering, in that way, how much of your book did you have to create effectively? Right. So there is a preface that she wrote to the book where she's describing her life and describes her relationship with her grandparents and some of the very specific incidents that happen in the novel, she says, happened to her. So, for example, she herself was not in good health a lot of the time, especially when she was younger. And there came that point where she was really at death's door, and her grandmother, who had died, visits her, you know, as a ghost, and tells her, go to my old notebook, go to this page, make this remedy and you're going to be better. You're going to get better. And this is the last of your illnesses. So is that totally far-fetched? You know, I get it depends on whether or not you believe in ghosts, but that is something that she wrote that she said happened to her. So as a novelist, that actually is not the, the kind of thing you want to work with sometimes, because how do you make it believable? even if she wrote that it happened to her. And then there are also these uh, little sections at the beginning, but also at the end. They're almost like testimonials. One is written by her nephew, one is written by an uncle, where they're also describing certain aspects of her life. The one at the end, written by her nephew, I found particularly interesting because he writes that she lived to be 96. And remember the grandmother in that ghostly visit says, you're going to live to be, I think it was 68. I can't remember off the top of my head, which in the Ming dynasty was pretty old, but in fact, she lived 96. People said, or this is what he writes, that her treatments got even better, that she rose to this level of medical practitioner where she could actually see into people's bodies like they were translucent and that her remedies were supposed to be supreme and amazing. But he asks, why didn't she write those down? And wonders, after she died, were there people in the household who just came and took her notebooks and threw them out or used the paper to cover jars like you would if you were making jam or something like that. So there are those kinds of things that give you hints about her life and some things that are very specific of what happened to her. Within that limited amount, I had to imagine what her life was like. Mm -hmm. You said about the grandmother's ghost, and I love that. I thought, I genuinely thought that that was something that you had created that is interesting i can yeah i can see the the context there and everything coming together i had somewhere read found out that she'd lived to 96 so when you come across the grandmother in your book saying oh you're gonna live until you're you're 68 i think you're whenever it was and i thought ah, no you're not it's that, that was very satisfying actually but no also i was surprised to find that it was able to be published and i suppose in the west being published and so celebrated wouldn't have happened at that time. So that was quite exciting to find out. One of the things that really inspired me, but also impressed me, is when you take this book and you put it in the context of world literature. Is a medical text world literature? You could question that. But if you think about 
what books are still in print from before 1511? You've got the Bible, the Iliad and the Odyssey, some Greek tragedies and comedies, Beowulf, and of course, all of those written by men. After that, it gets to be a lot harder to think about what books are still in print. And yes, there's the tales of Genji that was written in Japan by a woman. There's also Hildegard von Bingen, a Catholic nun who was born in 1098, who became an abbess, a composer, but also a physician. And she also wrote two books that have Western remedies based on herbal medicine as well. That's still in print, but she's not a, you know, she's not a household name. That's not like saying Homer, right? <laughs> so to me, that was one of the things that was so amazing is that this book had survived and still not only survived, but had continues to have an impact. That was awesome. And finding out that she is still used. Yes, everything you said is very interesting. On this subject of women doctors, something that was interesting to find out was that there were lots of them in China, but uh, I think I believe we don't have so many records of them, just mentions. In your research or anything, were you able to find out anything else about them or is it mostly Yun Shen we know about? Mostly the two that we know about are Yun Xian and her grandmother. Again, because this book has survived. Of the 10,000, I think it is, Chinese medical texts that have survived to today, only three of them were written by women. And the oldest one is miscellaneous records of a female doctor. So what does that say? Does that say that there were other women doctors who wrote things, but they were lost, not preserved? It's kind of hard to tell. You know, China, as you said, does have a history of female doctors that goes back about 2,000 years, but they were few and far between. I mean, I don't even think you could say 10%. It was a small number of women doctors. That's interesting to hear. I I suppose I had thought how wonderful the fact of the book is, Yun Xian's book and also yours, and was really hoping there were quite a few, but no, fair enough. But what there is, Mei Ling in the book... And she is a midwife. She learns from her mum. And a big part of the novel is Yun Xian's friendship with Mei Ling. And of course, it's kind of inferred by the title. Important too is the role of other women, two of whom are Yun Xian's grandmother, as you've introduced, and Miss Zhao. Can you tell us about the importance of friendships in this book? Yes. First, let me just say that Mei Ling, all these other characters are invented. And I wanted her closest friend to be a midwife because of that tradition in Chinese medicine in the past where doctors were not allowed to touch blood, to come in contact with blood. They could have a sort of philosophy about blood with a capital B, but just to touch it was just a filthy thing. It was like being a butcher. So a midwife was really looked down on. And yet, you know, if you're going to give birth, <laughs> you need to have somebody there to help you. And it's uh, a messy, messy business. So I had thought that it would be really interesting to have these two friends as a way to explore this philosophy of blood with a capital B and blood with a, a small b, and that idea of something that blood that is so basic to women, right? How you would treat women patients if blood is forbidden. So there's that. The other part is just the idea of friendship. So I, I am a woman. I write about women. Most of my readers, but not all, but most of my readers are women. So I have written about mothers and daughters, I've written about sisters, but I do keep coming back to friendship. I think that female friendship is unlike any other relationship we have in our lives. We'll tell a friend something that you wouldn't tell your mother, your husband, your boyfriend, your lover, your children. It's a very, very particular kind of intimacy. And of course, whenever you 
open your heart and are vulnerable, you're also open to being hurt and being betrayed. So I know a lot of people write about friendship, but for me, I always try to find that dark shadow side of female friendship. And I find those shadows are very interesting to explore. So that is why there are these times of jealousy then with Yun Xian. I think it's always where Yun Xian is the narrator towards Mei Ling. Well, I think they both have a little jealousy back and forth, right? I mean, Mei Ling looks at Yun Xian and thinks she's educated, she can read, she can write, she's got beautiful clothes, she doesn't have to work, she doesn't get her hands dirty, she lives in a beautiful place. She is a woman of great privilege. She's of the elite. Mei Ling is the daughter of a midwife and a midwife herself. She is in in this profession that's sort of looked at as being kind of like a butcher, very, very low. And of course, her, her mother doesn't have much money. There's no father there, apparently. There are some hints about what her life is like. There's that point when they're still both little girls and they are climbing around in Yan Shen's, her mother's marriage bed. It's almost like it's its own room. And she says, oh, this is bigger than the house where my mother and I live. And Yan Shen is just like, oh, I know she's just teasing me. But is she? I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, I think that could be pretty close to being accurate. So I can really understand the ways that Mei Ling feels jealousy or envy. And then the other side of it is how Yan Shen looks at Mei Ling, who can be out in the world, who can go to a fair, who can go to the dragon boat races, who has more autonomy, really, more of what we would think of as like modern autonomy, that a woman could support herself, could be out in the world. She doesn't have bound feet. She can go where she wants to go. You said about Mei Ling being just as jealous and you saying that has made me think, actually, yeah, you're completely right. I think it's so easy to get, especially in this book, actually, get stuck in Yun Xian's head for something that I will, I'll bring in in a minute. But I really liked how you wove in the friendship, what you did with it, things that we've been discussing. Can I ask also, you have Mei Ling and Yun Xian uh, part of the whole connection between them and the grandmother and uh, Mei Ling's mother kind of connecting them together is the use of their births being in the year of the snake, I believe. And I think they're talking about metal snakes. Are you able to just say a bit about how this relates and what this would have been further? Were they born in the year of the snake? Yes, they were. <laughs> you know what? This is the first interview that I've done about the book. So... <laughs> It's not totally fresh in my mind. It's kind of, I mean, I, you know, four months from now, you'll, somebody will say, tell us about the metal snake. And I'll be like, bum, 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 bum. <laughs> I'm not quite there yet. This is practice. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I find interesting about the Chinese Zodiac is that not only do you have, you're born in the year of the snake, the rooster, the dragon, the sheep, whatever, but that there are other cycles within that, that you are a metal snake, wood, water, you know, these five different elements. And that those also have an influence on you. Now, I actually am not remembering all the attributes for the snake right off the top of my head, but I can tell you when I was writing Snowflower and the Secret Fan, you have Snowflower and Lily, and they're both born in the year of the horse. But Lily sees herself as more of like a plodding workhorse, whereas Snowflower is this beautiful, elegant, galloping, almost flying horse. So to me, you can take those attributes, and of course, all these signs have positive attributes, and negative attributes, even within a year, even under that influence of water, wood, whatever it is, they're going to have positive and negative attributes. And so to be able to take, oh, I'm going to put some of those negative ones over here on Dinshan and some of the negative ones over here on Mei Ling, 
same with the positive. It's it actually becomes a pretty interesting way to develop a character, and it's something I've done. I did it in um, obviously Snowflower and the Secret Fan, but the Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane as well. Shanghai Girls. When you look at those things, just as a writer, it's a way to think about the complexities of a person and that everyone has good and bad attributes. Of course, we all like to think we're 100% good <laughs> attributes, but but we do have good and negative ones, characteristics. And to create a character who's really three-dimensional, you need to have both or some spectrum with them. Bring in some extra details and stuff and really helping fluff a character out, for want of a better word. I know, I know there's a better word in there somewhere. It's also kind of signaling to the reader, oh, here's this negative attribute, right? Like a she loves to be taken care of is typically somebody who likes frills and lace. Well, you know, again, we're talking about a snake for these characters, but let's pretend for a moment that these two girls were both in the year of the sheep. You could really see how Yen Shen really fits that, right? People take care of her to a great extent. She can dress however she wants. She can have all her adornments in her hair and her jewelry and all of that. Whereas Mei Ling might aspire to have those things, but she doesn't until, of course, she does attain some level of prosperity. But it's through her own work as opposed to just being born to it. For uh, Mei Ling's part, that's really pretty central to the plot of what happens to her when she's pregnant and what she does in an effort to make sure she has a baby. And that's directly related to how she feels her jealousy and envy of Genshin. You absolutely put your characters through the ringer. They go through such horrific, awful things. And I mean, on one hand, this is a very difficult book to read. And on the other hand, I mean, it's absolutely incredible to read as well. But you really do get a good sense of what these women went through. And I know you say, you've mentioned about Mei Ling's problem that she goes through. I think I read there was something like that that actually did happen in history. What happens to Mei Ling in the, in the Forbidden City was based on the true story of a midwife who had been sent to the Forbidden City to take care of the empress when she was pregnant and was going to give birth, was going to be the midwife for the empress. And this woman, this midwife, miscarried right in front of the empress, and her baby died. And then the emperor ordered that the midwife be killed because she like sullied the empress's eyes by miscarrying. And the empress and the other ladies of the court all went to the emperor and said, no, let her live. Please let her live. And they triumphed. I mean, the, the emperor said, yeah, but we're not going to let her get away completely free. You know, she still sullied your eyes. And so she was beaten all of the imperial gifts that she would have received for delivering the empress's child were taken away. So she was sent back home in disgrace, but she still had her life. And I thought that was such an interesting story that I really wanted to use it. It sort of goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning where you you know I I didn't have a whole lot to work with of what's known about Yenshun. But I did do so much research on midwives, on other doctors, on childbirth, that scene when Yan Shun is giving birth and the baby's foot comes out first. The midwife writes on the bottom of the foot, go home, and then sticks the foot with a pin so that the baby will pull its leg up. That also is a true story. It didn't happen to Yenshan, but it is a recorded birth and all of the details of it. So when I came across that, I was like, oh yeah, I could use that one. So even though I was limited in what I had to work with about Yenshan specifically, there were many, many stories that I could use that had happened 
to other women, either like Yanshan, you know, elite woman, or like Mei Ling, who was a, a midwife, and then some of those other women in between, right? Because one of the things that I wanted to do is to look at all the levels of society for women. So you have the servants, you have the concubines, you have the wives, you have working women, you have the empress. I was really trying to see all of those different levels. I, I think there's somebody who says it in the novel. You might, you might remember more than I did since I wrote it a little while ago. Uh, but that idea that it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, uh, you work or you don't work, when it comes to our biology and physiology, we have a lot in common. We are united by that. And so if you want to have a baby, your level of care may change depending on your economic status or your social status. But how that baby gets out, that's a universal. Hmm. Yeah, true. But we are talking about the royalty. You brought the emperor and empress into the book and Yunshen goes to the Forbidden City. And I'm really glad to hear that you wanted to add it because that was something that I was I was kind of hoping for, not necessarily if it was royalty, but for her to leave the household. Because I think definitely as a reader, you are effectively stuck in the household with her because it's her, her narrative. And this is kind of something that I wanted to talk about. It's something that struck me. Something that is just striking about the book, wonderful how you've done it, is that you've got these elite women living in these households, as you've talked about, they're isolated, they're limited in what they can do, and also they're effectively disabled by the foot binding, which is kind of a limit in itself. And yet you, you show all this very well, it's a big factor in the narrative. Are you able to talk about this while you're focused on the isolation? I know obviously there's historical context in it as well, but further on this and why you chose to focus on the foot binding kind of in the way that you did as much as you did, if that makes sense. That sense of isolation was so much a part of women's lives in China, really all the way up until when Mao took power in 1949. He was the first to say women hold up half the sky. And that half the sky phrase gets used a lot now, but I don't think most people know where it came from and that it came from him. And I'm not going to ever say anything positive about him because he did a lot of terrible things without question. But he was the first to say women hold up half the sky, and he meant it. And this meant that women who had been living pretty much behind closed doors, literally for centuries, had to come out. And you could work in the fields, you could work in a factory, you could go to school, you could become a doctor or a dentist but women had to come out. So if you think about Confucius and how he viewed women, he had a very, very negative <laughs> uh, view of women and some of his sayings, an educated woman is a worthless woman. You know, a good woman, and this one I'm paraphrasing, but a good woman would never go more than three steps beyond her door. When a girl obey your father, when a wife obey your husband, when a widow obey your son. So it's all about being obedient, uneducated, and locked up, basically. A proper woman is not going to venture out. And that's fine for a certain class, right, that can afford to do that. But then there are all the people who have to take care of that class of people, for one thing, and all the people who work in the fields and working people, working women. The reason I have more of a focus on bound feet in this novel, when the novel first opens, Yan Shen, she's just coming out of the process. Her mother dies, and this is not a big secret since it happens in the first chapter, but her mother dies as a result of an infection. And you don't know until much later like why that infection started, why it was ignored. You see Yen Shen binding her own daughter's feet and why that's so important for their futures, how bound feet, you know, are so entrancing 
to the men. So Miss Chen, but also Miss Zhao, both concubines who have tiny, tiny feet that are just entrancing to the men who own them. But even for Yan Shun, even when she's older and her husband has kind of lost interest in her, uh, you know, she'll hold her feet in his hands. They're still so precious to him. That idea that a woman, and as a girl, you know, would have gone through so much pain to achieve this level of first what was considered to be beauty, but it also was a message to your future in-laws, the people who you're negotiating with to set up a marriage, that here is someone who is obedient, who can withstand pain, who will do what's proper for a woman, that sort of sense of endurance, but physical as well as psychological endurance, and how valuable that is to have uh, those qualities to have as a wife or a mother. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, no, very much. Yeah, no, it's given me a deeper appreciation for the novel already. We've been talking about how I've had to make certain things up, but mm. I also was able to take her actual cases and build a story out of it. So, you know, I used certain cases that I could put onto Mei Ling to have to do with her fertility issues. The worm was not one of her own cases, but it is an existing case that I read about. And so when I've read that one, you know, again, I was like, oh, this is too good. I have to use it. Um, and it was based in totally on fact. And at the end, this woman who people kept saying she was drinking too much. And once they pull the worm out, the observation is she wasn't the one who was thirsty. It was the worm who was thirsty. Scholars believe that almost all of her patients were the women and girls who lived in this compound home where she lived with her husband's family. So, you know, you have to imagine you have this big compound where you're living with about 100 relatives, plus the servants who take care of you. And she always says, you know, a girl from an elite family, a woman who is married to a scholar, a woman who's unhappy because her husband just took on another concubine. That these are all believed to be people who live in the compound. Girls, you know, what what happened? The little girl who is the daughter of a concubine who's been spoiled so much that she's sick from all these fancy foods. So all of those are real, but they're also the cases where it's very clear that it's a servant who probably lives in that same compound. But the ones that were so intriguing to me were the cases of the woman brick and tile maker, and also the woman who steered the tiller on a ship. So if Tan Yunshan never left her compound, as she was not supposed to do as an elite woman, how did she meet those people? So that's part of why Yen Shun has to get on a boat and also to think about how could she have met that tile maker, as you know, to go and meet the tile maker. Mei Ling gives her a pair of boots and they stuff the toe with rags and stuff so that she's kind of clomping along, but like a big footed woman. And in that moment, she has this experience of what it would be like to walk wherever she wanted, to go wherever she wanted. But of course, then really what she wants to do is go back home, shut the door. You know, it's, it's very unnerving to her. When you say about the worm, I think some of the treatments, some of the diagnoses, you can kind of work out from what you've given us. The worm one I wasn't expecting, my goodness. I hope you liked it because I just loved that. I just, I had so much fun thinking about it and sort of laying in the clues about it, but also just when that worm comes out, I just, oh, I was so happy. <laughs> oh, definitely. I mean, again, you, you say this, I've read it, you're effectively adding to what I've read with your words here, which makes me think of other contexts and meanings and things like that. But no, yeah, it, it was a surprising diagnosis to me. I obviously hadn't picked up on things. But to talk of someone else in this book, it kind of creates the transition between who they had been to Yun Xian and who they are going forward effectively, because they are still still there at the end of the novel, which is lovely, because I was wondering if at the end of the novel they wouldn't be around. 
Can you talk about Lady Quo? Could she have been nicer um, in terms of the context of what she was living in? How did you come to create her? That kind of thing. Just more details about her. Lady Quo is Tan Yan Shannon's mother-in-law. She is, I think it's safe to say, a difficult woman, uh, very critical, wields her power within the inner chambers. She likes to wield her power, let's just say. There is a long tradition in Chinese culture that the mother-in-law is difficult and critical and mean. Why would that be in real life? Like, why would that be? Here was the one place that a woman could actually have some power, who could lord it over someone. And of course, that woman had come up as a daughter-in-law. So every daughter-in-law has suffered as a daughter-in-law until she gets to be a mother-in-law, and then she gets to do the same thing to her daughter-in-law. Now, I am a daughter-in-law. My mother-in-law passed away a couple of years ago, so I guess I can say I was a daughter-in-law, but now I'm the mother-in-law of two daughters-in-law. It's a really interesting relationship. And it is one of the relationships that I keep coming back to in my writing, I think because I've been on both sides of that as a daughter-in-law and now as a mother-in-law. But to think about those kinds of I can't even say it was a stereotype. I mean, yes, in a way, it is a stereotype about the Chinese mother-in-law. But on the other hand, it was so prevalent that this was the one time that a woman could have power over someone else, that it was really just accepted within the culture that you know that this is going to happen. In fact, I'm I'm just doing research for what's going to be the next book, and it actually takes place here in Los Angeles in about 1870, when there were only 5,000 residents here in the city, only 5,000, not many, and of those 5,000, 190 were Chinese, and of that 190, only 34 were Chinese women. Not a whole lot has been written about the immigrant experience for Chinese women in that time period. It's still very, very early. It's not until about 1920 that people start really doing any research on them or capturing diaries or letters or anything like that. But one of the things that's really clear is that as difficult as it was to be an immigrant, and this was a Wild West town. I mean, it was just actually the most violent of all of the Western towns, where they had shoot 'em ups on the street every day and things like that. But the women who were here, those 34, about half of them were wives and the other half were prostitutes. Across the board, the one thing they all enjoyed was that they didn't have their mother-in-law here. And it's, it is the one thing that's sort of been captured in history. Of, oh, life was really hard for these women, but they didn't have to deal with the mother-in-law. So that's what I would have to say about Lady Kuo. But, you know, the other thing is a mother-in-law, maybe because I am one, how she presents and all that criticism, what's that there for? Yes, it's to wield power, but it's also to make the family happy, to make the family function, uh, make your son happy, all of those things. And I think Yan Shen comes to understand Lady Quo by the end to see, oh, she wasn't as evil as a thought. <laughs> you know, evil may be too much of a, too harsh a word, but she was, but she really, in many ways, had everyone's best interests at heart, even if she makes some pretty terrible errors of judgment. I liked her as a character, and I, I thought, at some point, I'm, I'm seeing her changing, and it was lovely that she did. You say about having that power, and I've just noted down, you given with the things that you talk about in the novel about how a woman has to be, I suppose she could at last also be more angry and let the anger out a bit more. Not completely, obviously, or there would have been a problem. But yes, I suppose Lady Quo in the mother-in-law and, and a mother-in-law in that culture could maybe, yeah, let the anger out a bit more and be more emotional maybe. Is that kind of correct? Well, I think the way that they would let their anger out was again by scolding other people and 
kind of like a tyrant in the inner chambers. I don't think she rises to the level of tyrant. I mean, she runs things with an iron fist, certainly. But I don't think she's particularly evil and that idea of expressing anger. You know, even now, are women really supposed to express anger, right? And if you do, you're seen not as someone exerting your power, but you're, oh, look, she's a bitch or whatever. You know, that it it's still one of those qualities that's very difficult for women to express, I think. There are these other women in the story who are around Yan Shen. Miss Zhao is her father's concubine, and eventually they have a lot of interactions. And Miss Zhao is, in effect, like a stepmother, you know, and certainly there's that trope of your new stepmother saying, I'm never going to be your mother, but maybe we can be friends. And I think that scene as they're first going to Wu Shi, Miss Zhao says that, look, we're going into a household that we only know each other. They don't know us, so we can count on each other. But it takes Yan Shan, oh, I'd say another decade or two to get to a place where she can really appreciate Miss Zhao for who she is. That whole idea of the circle of women, Yan Shan, I believe, sees herself as kind of orphaned, and she is in many ways. And it takes her this lifetime to realize partly that she's built a circle but that this circle has been around her from the beginning. She just didn't recognize it. You have just mentioned, I think Miss Zhao is my favorite character, actually. Yeah, I love her. I just love her. And she's so wise. And she has a difficult life in many ways. And she also is a person who has been in the world when they're traveling from the town where the story starts to she and they pass through Shanghai and Miss Tsao has that moment of, oh yes, this city, you know, this is this is a place, you know, this is a place where you can have some fun. So you know she's had a life outside of living within the family and how she is really very devoted to the grandparents, how she remains loyal within the family, how she has this kind of position as chaperone for Yan Shen, certainly in the early travels, but then when they go to the capital. And then, of course, during the epidemic, the smallpox epidemic, and to see the grandmother and Miss Sao and Yan Shen working together, along with poor Miss Chen. And you see them starting to form this group, the circle, where they're really supporting each other, and working together and respecting each other for the qualities that they have and the skills that they have. Well, yeah, I, not to disrespect Yun Xian's mum at all, because obviously she's, as you said, she's not in the book very long and obviously she is the mother. But there is something, and I, I, will, I will kind of paraphrase it because it's a long paragraph, but something that I noted down was when Yun Xian is thinking about how Miss Zhao is on the boat with her and she lets her up and to see things. And in the, in her narrative, Yan Xian is, is saying how, well, okay, she's let me on the boat to be able to see things and stuff, but she's not a real mother because effectively my mum wouldn't have done that. And that's a really kind of hard-hitting moment because you can already see that Miss Zhao is, really does care for her. And yeah, as you say, Yan Xian progresses in how she feels about her and I do love that Miss Zhao is there in the entire book I'm glad that she doesn't get sold or anything yeah so you've also mentioned your new book I'm going to get to that in a minute one thing I wanted to ask we've talked things about around the subject is the mystery you have the spinster aunt and you're like mm, something going to happen here because you're, you're setting up something that could possibly happen something does happen and then there is this whole investigation about her death and then later you go back to the subject. Why was it important to have this whole storyline, this plotline? Two reasons. The first is that certainly a through line in this story is the importance of for a woman to have a son and how critical that is 
for her, the respect that she receives, for what it means to the family. She really just has to have a son. And you see that play out in different ways with the, some of the different patients who come uh, with the issues with Mei Ling's fertility and will she ever get pregnant and what happens when she is pregnant. Tan Yanshan herself has the three daughters, and this is, that is true. She had three daughters before she had a son. Her son was the last one born, and then there was quite a space after the third daughter to when her son was born. So that idea of the importance of having a son certainly carries through. The other part that really fed into the book was another book, not Tan Yanshan's book, but this book called The Washing Away of Wrongs. And it's believed to be the first book of forensic medicine ever written, centuries before anything like that was written in Europe. And that particular book, you know, was written, I think, in the 1200s. But a lot of the methods of forensics were still used by forensic departments in China until this century, or you know, the end of the last century, so only 23 years ago. So again, I was able to take some of the real stories from that book, which is it is kind of a companion to miscellaneous records of a female doctor. Here you have this doctor recording her cases that are all women and girls of different status, and over here it's a man who is recording all of his cases of people who've died in the wrong way. You know, they haven't died of natural causes. One is about life and one is about death. So I really wanted to use, again, because what's known about Tan Yanshan herself is so limited that this was a, another way to help build out the story. So to me, it was those two things. First, that idea of the need to have a son, and then this really interesting book that I felt was not just a companion, but, but it was like the yin and yang, right? Life and death, written by two different people who are really looking at what it means to be human, but from two very different perspectives. Fascinating. And yeah, I mean, it, it definitely works in the context and everything you've done with it. No, it, that's that's interesting. Yeah. So I take it back. It wasn't two. It was actually three. The third is that midwives were often a coroner's assistant, would serve as a coroner's assistant. They could get their hands dirty. This, again, is so contrary to anything that a doctor would do. Again, to me, it's sort of the black to the white, the yin to the yang, that I thought gave another layer to Mei Lin and would emphasize that sense of the pollution and how polluted she is. And of course, that's how she sees her, you know, that she can't get pregnant because she's so polluted. But uh, there is a fourth thing, which is Han Yanshan's father, husband, grandfather, uncle, they all work for what was called the Bureau of Punishment, the Ministry of Punishment. So it's, it's like the Justice Department except that they are the ones who say how people get punished. It's about punishment, but the punishments were so harsh, right? It's beating with a heavy rod, decapitation. I mean, they weren't messing around, but their punishment. But being a physician is the exact opposite of that. So within her family, you have people who are focused on punishment and death, and then the grandmother and Yanshan focused on life. Then this is one of the reasons that the grandfather, you know, who had been in the bureau and then became a doctor, that he saw that, that this was something that he had done. So yes, he was doing the right thing, but it was so much about death and punishment and pain, whereas medicine was about curing people, life, the sort of lighter side of being human. The punishments, you know that everyone seems to go into that business effectively, we call it business for want of a better word at the moment. But I suppose it was interesting to see what they did as well as you don't really want to know because you know it's going to be bad. I think why I'm, I'm thinking that is because of how you included the men in the book. I had 
thought first from the way that you were concentrating, understandably, on Yin Xian and the women that they wouldn't be included. And then you do include, I think it's Maoren. He, he gets a bit more time and then he goes off and does things. Every, all the men are going off and doing things and, and living completely unlimited uh, lives. And then you get the father coming back, which was interesting because, again, I didn't think we'd see him again. And the grandfather is, has a pretty big presence. That's true. Yes, very true. I, I didn't think of him in that moment, but he's he gets the medicine as well, doesn't he? So he's kind of more in tune, I suppose I want to say, than the others maybe with the women. I don't know. Well, he did. I mean, this is a historical fact that he did have regrets about what he had done and that this was why he decided that he would become what was called a literary doctor, a literati doctor, somebody who learns to be a doctor by reading books. So he he has that literati background, but the grandmother, she's a doctor because her parents were doctors and grandparents, and it's something that's been passed down generation by generation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We are going to have to stop there on this conversation, I think, because of time. But you have mentioned the book you're working on. Is there any more that you can tell us at this moment about it? Just very quickly. In 1871, in Los Angeles, there was a massacre of the Chinese, where it was 19 men and boys were shot, stabbed, and hung. It's considered to be one of the largest, if not the largest, mass lynching in the history of the United States, something that has really disappeared from history. But I am telling the story from the perspective of three women who were there. And out of the 34 women who were here, these are truly pioneer women who even just how they got here is quite an adventure. But to see the city and the time and the place and how these women who in China would have had zero power Uh, really find a way to have control over their lives. Well, not all of them, but one of them, her husband, coincidentally, was a doctor. He was the second man killed, and she eventually filed a lawsuit against the city of Los Angeles. She was the first Chinese woman to sue anybody here. So she tried to take some control over what had happened and get retribution. I think that's about as much as I can tell you. Sounds fascinating. I look forward to it. Yeah, it sounds quite different to your books that I've read so far. So that's brilliant. So Lisa, it's been an absolute pleasure having you today. Effectively, thank you for this book. It's been lovely reading it. It's been absolutely epic book. Yeah, thank you for being here today. It's been great. Thank you for having me. And thank you very much for listening. Please do share this episode on social media. The Wormhole Podcast, episode 79, was recorded on the 28th of March and published on the 24th of July, 2023. Music and production by Charlie Place.